Good evening. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, thanks, Dave, for the kind introduction, and Ken for the um, for inviting me to be here this evening in the library for for hosting the event. Um, I'd like to uh, speak a little bit about the restoration of Gull, shown there in the photo, but also speak a little bit more just about our restoration uh, process and philosophy in general. Um, when you take on a project like this, it doesn't seem to matter how small or how large the boat, there are a lot of philosophical and moral questions that come up and we, uh, we try to answer them with as much consistency as we can. So throughout the process, um, hopefully I can explain more of that and I hope that you will all ask a lot of questions. This will be really dry if it's just me showing slides. So please just interject if you have any questions or, or comments or, or what have you. Um, so Gull was designed in 1923 um, for members of the Fishers Island Yacht Club. And at the turn of the last century, one design racing, where they have multiple boats of, of an identical design, was sort of a new thing. Up until that point, it was mostly custom-built, custom-designed boats that were racing under a, under a rule. Um, this boat would have rated in the 15-foot waterline rule. Um, most boats back then were measured by the length of their waterlines and not their, their overall length because that was more indicative of the performance that might be expected out of them. Um, so the, the members of the Yacht Club went to, to Charles D. Mower and uh, this, uh, this Fisher's Island One design was the result. They were built down at the uh, Henry Nevins Yard in City Island, New York. And these black and white photos of, the, of them racing in the early days were, uh, were from a, a book that was published in 2004 called The History of the Fisher's Island Yacht Club by uh, John Rusmary. You can see the nice big steamship in the back. Let me see if the pointer works Is there. Is that Good. the Fisher's Island south of Connecticut? Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. <laughs> they had these, these big wonderful balloon spinnakers that they would fly with the original gaff rigs and uh, unfortunately we don't see many of those around anymore. But you can see the, uh, the, the beauty of having a one design fleet is that you, you have multiple boats of the same design and it, it brings a real spirit of competition and fairness. Um, if, if you have a fleet of boats that are all of disparaging lengths and weights and um, sail areas, then you have to wait until after the race is finished to find out who won and it's more about math than it is about uh, sailing. And uh, this lower photo is a nice demonstration of the uh, stability of, of the boats with a uh, girls camp aboard. The, uh, the first 10 boats were built by Nevins um, for $400 a piece was the cost of a, a brand new one. Another uh, 16 boats were added to the fleet in 1923 and it, at that point the cost per boat was up to $985 because uh, Nevins didn't feel like they were making enough profit on the first batch. And as inexpensive as that may sound, that's uh, $985 was three times the cost of a Model T Ford. Mm. So in uh, the early 30s, 1930, 31, uh, the fleet was entirely converted to Marconi rig, which was the, uh, the fad in those days. And the folks in Fishers Island decided that their boats were a little too tippy for them and they wanted uh, something more stable. So they started to get into the Looters 16s and the International One designs and, and more keel boats. So the entire fleet of um, Fishers Island 12 and a halfs was sold to the folks in Groton Long Point, just across the Sound in Connecticut. And the uh, Groton Long Point Yacht Club was formed in 1934 and these boats were called the A-Class. And today there are 14 of these A-Class boats still racing, which makes them the third uh, most active, the third oldest fleet of continually active um, sailboats in the United States. And of course the, the oldest fleet is the North Haven dinghies over across the bay. And the second oldest is the IDEM scows that race up in uh, the Adirondacks. <coughs> So uh, in the fall of 2013, we, we got a, a general inquiry from a fellow, an email, and he said, I, I have this old boat that my father gave me and it leaks, and I, I wonder if you might come and take a look at it. <laughs> and we, uh, we, we, we get these, these calls once in a while, and uh, we're happy to go look at it. And this actually was a class that I was not familiar with. I'd never heard of these boats before, so I was, I was pretty excited to do some research and find out that, that, that they had the history and the, and the pedigree that they do. And I, I went down and I looked at the boat and I, I, I said, I'm really sorry, but, but this just, this, this, there's no fix here. This isn't worth fixing. And, and, and he was really discouraged. Um, 
he had done a lot of work or had a lot of work done in the early 80s and he was showing me the new deck and all the new frames and all, all the work that had gone into this boat and I, I, I just said, I'm, I'm really sorry, but there's, there's not much we can do for it. Um, so, so we went back and forth a few times and the, and the, and the conversation continued and, and we said, look, if, if we're going to do this, the only way to, to get any value out of it is to do it right and to do it once and for the result to be that of a new boat. And we'll do what we can to preserve the pedigree and the, and the uh, patina of the original, but to try to fix this, the quote unquote fix, would, would really be sort of a waste of money. So, so after a lot of um, soul searching and conversation with his family and, and, and other members of the fleet, he, he, he decided to go for it. <coughs> and um, and some, of the, some of the questions that we asked, I, I apologize for the bullets, there won't be many of them, but when trying to decide whether it's worth it to, to, to go to this length with a boat, um, we have to ask ourselves a few questions. One of the first is, is, does the boat have significant sentimental value? If it's a boat that just fell into your lap a few weeks ago and you don't know anything about it and, and it's just a cool thing, it, it might not be worth fixing. Um, does it have a well-documented pedigree? If, if it's a Harishoff boat and it's got a builder's plate, then, then the easy answer is yes. Um, some of the uh, the next tier, like the mower boats and the uh, crown and shield boats, and you know anything by Starling Burgess or any of these other well-known, you know Alden, Sparkman, and Stevens. A lot of them didn't have builders' plates, but if through historical documents and, and records they can be traced back to an original set of plans and, and, and an original owner, and that that provenance is intact, that adds a lot of value to the boat uh, that it might not have otherwise. Um, the original hardware, ballast keel. Um, any boat with a lead keel has value because that stuff's worth about a dollar a pound. So if uh, there's a rotten old boat in your backyard, we could look into uh, salvaging that. Um, and is there an active racing class? There's a lot of fleets in New England that still race 100-year-old wooden boats. And sometimes there are fiberglass counterparts that race along with them, but sometimes, like these Fisher's Island One designs, they're all wooden boats. So the only way to get into the fleet is to, uh, is to fix the originals. Um, and then if it's available, what's the cost for a fiberglass replacement? Uh, this is a, a conversation that's been taking place on Islesboro quite a lot lately. They have this, this fleet of original Dark Harbor 20s out there, but they also have fiberglass replacements available, and some people are choosing to scrap the wooden boat, move the house over, move the hardware over, move the rig over, and um, hit the water with a fiberglass boat, which is a, which is a legitimate decision, but I think it's important to weigh the costs and, and, and really make, make an informed decision. Um, one thing that's wonderful about wooden boats is they are fixable. Um, they, they, they are infinitely fixable, even as, as you can see in that early picture, if it's a pile of compost in the backyard, if it's got some pedigree, if it's got some hardware, and if it's got a keel, it will always be less expensive to fix that boat, to restore that boat, than it would be to build another one from scratch um, if, if the restoration is well planned and, and well executed. So this is goal. Um, what's left of her? She, uh, she came into the shop and we, uh, we started pulling her apart and, 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 and planning the restoration. I guess that's the most important thing here is, is, is planning at this stage. We, we really want to make sure that we have a very well-established set of goals, a well-established budget, um, and a really clear idea of, of, of what this is going to entail before we start. So. This is the last bullet point, I promise. Um, we, we, we set these goals and we use these as a guideline for a lot of projects, again, regardless of, of, of the size of the boat. Um, a lot of people have, have wasted a lot of time and energy on wooden boats over the years fixing them. And I think this has really led to a, a bad rap for wooden boats. People, people think, oh, these things are a nightmare. And it's true. They, um, the, these boats that were 60 or 80 years old, like, like most of them are, um, were intended to last 15 or 20 years and they were designed for racing so they were as light as possible and uh, there were new one design fleets coming along all the time so there was really no incentive for the designer or the builder to make a boat that was going to last 50 years. That would have been a waste of, waste of resources back then. So it's, it's a real testament to the design that they, they have lasted this long at all. Um, and they've depreciated three or four times over. So yes, they're a nightmare, but if, if you really go back and, and do, do the work correctly and sort of reinvest in the value of a, a new boat, 
it, uh, it's going to be less expensive than, um, than, than replacing it from scratch. Um, one of our real focuses is to restore the shape of the boat. It's, it's heartbreaking to me to see a wooden boat restored with hog, which is a reverse shear, or you know, sagging bilges, or, or there's just, there's the, as, as the process is going forward, there's so much we can do to draw the boats back to their original shape. And, and that sweet shear line when they're relaunched is, is really the, the indicator of, of, of whether that was done well or not. So that's a priority. Um, we want to eliminate all the iron or stainless fasteners. Over the years, bronze has been proven to be the only metal that works well in conjunction with wood. Um, we want to be respectful of original construction, layout, details. We, we don't want to take, take an heirloom and turn it into something that it's not because that's going to kill the value of it. Um, but at the same time, we want to we want to learn from um, from what we see, and you can see a lot of um, boats have had a lot of repairs over the years, and it's important to to learn from them and figure out what worked and what didn't, and try to correct some of these engineering deficiencies, and and hopefully do that in a way that that's not going to adversely affect the the character of the boat. And last, we want to replace any modern hardware with period correct hardware, and, and that doesn't necessarily mean hardware that doesn't work well, it just means hardware that looks right. And we're lucky there are some manufacturers like J.M. Reinick and Son and Toplicht in Germany that, that make a whole array of bronze hardware that, that looks correct but, but works, uh, works well. <coughs> so with Gull um, or with any boat, the, the key, once you've planned the, the um, extent of the restoration is to is to get to the bones as quick, pretty heavy-handed with with taking the boat apart. And the, the, in the case of this, the, a chainsaw takes the deck off in about 15 minutes, where it gets hung from the ceiling, and we'll uh, we'll get back to it later. The centerboard trunk here, which which the owner was convinced was the root of his problems, came out without the aid of any tools. That just <laughs> hooked, hooked on. It's like pulling a tooth. Um, it's also interesting to see here in the bottom of the boat the, uh, the reverse section of all those frames, and that's the result of, of sitting on trailer bunks full of snow and ice and leaves, and, and, and that, that, that's been pushed in there. And, and somebody in the 80s had actually reframed the boat. They, they'd come along, they'd taken the deck off, they'd replaced the whole deck frame, and they'd replaced all of these frames probably while it was sitting on those trailer bunks and, uh, and, and just built that shape right into it. So ironically, the best candidates for restoration are boats that have never had any work done. And the, the, more, the more worn out they are uh, consistently, the easier it is to take them apart and the easier it is to uh, draw them back to their original shape. This is the, the breast hook that ties the ends of the boat together. And um, one of the nicest details of construction should be the way the stem comes up through the deck and it had been cut off flush and replaced in part with putty. But you can also see that the, the bilge clamps here and the, um, the inside of the planking are uh, in pretty good shape. And, uh, and this sort of light brown primer was a, was a great tool for us to, to identify what structural elements of the boat were original and, and what, what wasn't. And that, that's helpful in, in knowing what worked and what didn't. This is, the, uh, this is what's left of the plank keel. And that, did that get turned sideways or did I? I think it's me. This, uh, this picture of the mast step really tells, tells us a lot. There's a great, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot that can be learned from this. Um, we can see that the inside of the planking is still in pretty good shape despite the cotton that's being pushed through. And you can see somebody's gone through the whole boat with, with slick seam, a wax seam compound, and tried to stop the leaking from the inside. But these new frames, um, which were just 20 years old or so, were, were not connected to the floor timbers. They, they were screwed to the planking right to this point, and then the rest was just floating. And, and that connection between the floor timbers and the, the frames is one of the important, most important structural elements in a wooden boat. And, and this frame, which is wider than the others, has that gray primer. So we determined that that was an original frame that, that they hadn't bothered to replace. And you can see right here that it's separated from the bottom of the keel about two inches. And, and the original frame actually runs right from shear to shear across the keel. And all these new frames that they put in stopped at the keel. And, and so what had happened is the force of the mast pushing down on the mast step had pushed the bottom of the boat down about two inches, which is why they added this 
block because the, uh, the, the, the shrouds were too loose. They couldn't get tension in the rig anymore. They bottomed out their turnbuckles. So a few more years, they might have needed another block. And uh, it's, 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 it's a wonder why it, uh, it's a wonder it floated at all. The, the fact that it didn't have a ballast keel really was, I think, the only reason they were able to retrieve it at the end of the, the season. Let me go back one. So uh, these are the plans, the construction drawing. Um, for a lot of these early boats, we'd, we'd have you know, maybe three or four sheets of plans for the entire project as opposed to a, a modern boat. We're, we're doing a David Pedrick rig right now, which is probably 300 pages just for the spars and hardware on the rig. So this, this is sort of nice working with the older designs. Um, this is the construction drawing. There was a sail plan and, and a lines plan. And so from the lines plan, we, we go into the computer. We used to do this on the floor, but, but the computer is a lot faster and, and better at generating patterns quickly. So we loft the boat in the computer and generate these plywood molds um, that are the uh, correct section of the boat. And you can see, again, this uh, deformation in the bottom and all the slick seam they were trying to use and, um, and just how badly the shape had distorted the sagging bilges. And it's just it's, it's kind of amazing. So what we've done is inserted these plywood molds. And at the same, I'll go back one. Um, as, we're, as we're pushing these molds into the boat, we're taking out the frames. And it's a real delicate process because we don't want to lose the boat. Um, we, so we have, to, we have to be adding structure at the same time we're taking it away and also achieving the flexibility that we need to, um, to be able to draw the, the shape of the boat back. And, uh, and, and so here she is sort of at her, at her most delicate. And, uh, we, we have these temporary molds in the boat every, every two or three feet. And the only structure left is, is the planking. All the frames are gone. All the floor timbers are gone. The keel's gone. Uh, the stem and transom are still on. But it's, it's nerve-wracking to walk by the boat at this stage because you, you worry if you bump into it or you sneeze, the whole thing could fall apart and, and, and you lost the, uh, lost the artifact. <coughs> um, this is the new plank keel, which, which is pretty exciting to finally see some new wood going back into the boat. And we, uh, we determined from the onset that we were going to do this restoration fairly traditionally. We weren't going to use a lot of epoxy. Um, we weren't going to edge glue the planks or spline the seams. We were, we were going to be respectful of the original construction. But we decided that laminating the keel in three layers would, would really add a lot of stability. We could see how badly the old one had rotten and checked and twisted. And um, it gets quite thin at the ends of the centerboard trunk. So we, we laminated this one in three layers and then put these uh, longitudinal ribbands on the outside of the planking. And this is just, uh, if, if anybody's in the construction industry, LVL timbers are these, you can get them in any size, but up to 40 feet lengths. So we get these from Viking Lumber and rip them up into ribbands. And they're, they're wonderfully uniform and stiff. And they, uh, they, they provide the longitudinal structure that the planking is lacking right now. And we'll need that to steam the new frames into without further distorting the hull. Um, you can't see here, but the boat's bolted to the floor at both ends. There are eye bolts set down into the concrete that are, that are pulling the ends down. And then we use the laser level um, to reference marks on the plywood molds to, to really ensure that the, uh, the shape of the boat, both longitudinally and sectionally, is exactly where it should be. We, we do this all the time. You'll see throughout these slides, sometimes she's right side up, sometimes she's upside down. If, if it was a bigger boat, we might do this lef less often. But with uh, four chain falls and some slings, it, it only takes a little while to, to do. So they're, um, they're getting ready to put the floor timbers in. Um, and you can see the blue chalk here is, uh, is, is what they're using to, to help fit the first one down. And a hot glue gun and some, some Luan. And they'll, they'll make a pattern for each floor timber, rough it out, and then use chalk to fit it down to the hull. And all these little chunks of wood are, are helping to tie the planking temporarily to the molds until the frames go back in. Here's the new frames being steamed into the boat. Um, you can see all the new floor timbers have already been installed. The tops are tied together to continue the curve so that they don't flatten out in the top sides. What species of wood are you using for the keel and the frames? Oak, white oak? White oak for the frames. We used Oroco for the keel and the uh, floor timbers um, because it's less rot or more rot resistant and, and a little bit more stable. White oak would have been fine too. Um, a modern concession we did make was uh, using plywood for the centerboard. Um, that, that's almost a universal improvement we make on any boat with a centerboard. The solid wood ones just don't, don't last. And uh, that's uh, fiberglass with epoxy on the inside. And it'll get epoxy coated on the outside. 
Um, so those connections between the frames and the floor timbers that were missing from that repair in the 1980s have, have been done here. We use a 5200, which is a slightly elastic adhesive um, between the two, and there's three or four <coughs> copper rivets that, um, that are installed. So that, that connection becomes absolutely rock solid. And then everywhere but in way of the centerboard trunk, we've made the frames run continuous from one side of the boat to the next. Uh, where they tie into the centerboard trunk, they're, they're pocketed in um, for, for more strength. And then uh, limber holes, these, uh, these little nice um, coves are to allow fresh water, or any water to drain to the low point of the bilge. And that's, that's another thing that, that kills these. If you have any, any water trap in the boat, it'll, it'll sit there and collect leaves and, and eventually rot. So here's the bottom structure finished. Um, you can see we've gone back and put these wide frames in. And uh, interestingly, those wide frames weren't shown in the plans, but they were original. So we determined that was something that, that Nevins had done on their own. They felt like the boat needed a little bit more structure at the ends of the uh, centerboard trunk. And, and so they did that, and we, we decided to honor it and uh, keep them there. And it's those structural details, I think, that really do give the boat a history. That's, that, that, that's the sort of thing that, that will continue to identify this boat as an original Fisher's Island One design. And it's a real um, responsibility of ours, I think, when we're restoring a boat like this. Even, even though we're re replacing as much as we are, really the more we replace, um, the more obligated I feel we are to make sure that we honor the original construction and that we don't have something leave the shop that, that's in any way different than what came in, other than returning the, uh, the integrity to it. Uh, yes? <coughs> Do you know if Gulf came from the first batch or the second batch? She came from the second batch. They, they made some structural updates to the f um, based on the experience with the first batch, and I don't know that any of the first ones survived. So I think all 13 that are still racing in Groton are, are from the second batch. I know a few of them were lost in the hurricane of 1938, and, and they're still looking for them. Yeah. <laughs> um, so here we're putting the planks back on the boat, and the, uh, the, the garboard plank is new. There wasn't much left of the original. But from the garboard up to the shear, we're reusing all of the original cedar planks from the early 20s. And you can see the, uh, this is a butt joint where, where two ends of a plank came together. And it's a, it's a, um, it's a problem area. They're, they're, you, know, you can see some of the plank ends start to split. That's where uh, boats start, you know, they tend to start leaking there and, and, and loosen up. So we've scarfed out all the butts with these, um, these cedar scarf repairs using epoxy. And here's a detail of it. And uh, the beauty of that is, is you're, you're, you're basically creating a full-length plank. Structurally, you could, you could pick the end of this thing up and, and shake it around, and it would, if it broke, it would break somewhere other than, than at that scarf. And it's invisible on the inside. You can still see the, just a clean butt where the two ends come together. So you were um, adding strength to the boat with, without, um, without um, any visible uh, difference. And where, where all the old fasteners are, you can see we've used this thickened epoxy putty. And there are quite a few different types of epoxy putty um, that we use in wooden boats. And the purple stuff is the closest to wood as far as its density and its, its physical properties. So um, it's, a, it's a good balance. And uh, each plank is taken off the boat, repaired on the bench, and then reinstalled so that the old cotton and seam compound is cleaned off and they're refit tightly to their neighbors. So um, you're, you're able to get essentially a brand new seam. And you can see on the, on the right-hand side, um, there's a whole bunch of butts on, on in close proximity. And, and before, when those were traditional butt blocks, that was a real weak point in the boat. And I, I think that's probably a result of a grounding, an accident she had. She probably got a hole in her. Um, and that, that history is still there. Where that big lump of putty had been, we, we scarfed in a new, uh, new top to the stem. And, you can see the uh, the contrast between the you know the new fasteners that have been sunk in, and then the uh, all the purple putty where the old fasteners were. And here we are down to the shear plank, and the, the shear plank is a little bit wider than the original one was because we've lost a little bit every plank that we uh, renew the edge of. It it gets uh, side set, and what we do is is uh, with the new fasteners we go through and we we glue in cedar plugs so that. In the future, when somebody comes back to replace a broken frame or replace a plank, um, they're, they're looking at something that's, that's very familiar. You don't see a bunch of epoxy putty. You see nice, clean cedar plugs, and they'll, they'll know where the screws are. So uh, not only is this boat 
restorable now, but in another 80 years when she needs it again, um, that, that same process is, is going to be available to her. Uh, like I said before, we're, we're caulking it with cotton, uh, the old-fashioned way. It doesn't get pounded in much on a boat like this. It's mostly rolled in with something that looks like a pizza cutter. And here's Timo uh, putting on the dead wood and red lead on the bottom and seam compound in the top side seams. And uh, we, uh, we opted to reuse the rudder, and this was a, a huge mistake. We, we were, uh, for, for one reason or another, we were trying to save money at that point. And, uh, and it looked okay, but as it turned out, when they had rebuilt the boat in the 80s, the uh, bolts that go from these holes through into the shaft, it's a bronze shaft that's probably original to the boat, and they used galvanized threaded rod to, to tie that together. So about a month after we delivered the boat, they were in the middle of a race down in Groton, and they lost the rudder, and we had to send two guys down to haul it out and make a new rudder, and they ended up losing a week of the season, and it was all for the, the you know, I mean, it, it was a bad decision to, to not replace that when we had the opportunity to. Here she is right side up, and you can, you can really see the contrast now. The, uh, the ends are higher than the middle. And she's actually, uh, you can just barely see, she's bolted to the floor in the middle right now to keep that shape. Every time we flip the boat over, it, it gets easier each time, but, but we have to, to reestablish her uh, level and, and make sure she's not twisted because it's, it's, it's just as easy to build in a, a, you know, a twist or a hog or, or any sort of um, shape problem as, as, as it is to get it out, but you, you have to be looking for it all the time. So, so the stands are keeping her, keeping her square. And you can see up on the wall, this is, uh, um, that's the original, or not the original, that's a deck frame that was put in in the 80s. And it's not original, it's mahogany instead of oak. Um, and there, it, it, it's, a bit, it's a bit weird, but it was, it, it was, it was easy to salvage. We, we just put these stringers around the edge and lifted it off like a fish skeleton. And, and we'll reuse that, um, which again, will save a little bit of money. And it was another small concession we made. Um, we are reusing the original shear clamps, and you can see these are being through riveted with, with heavy copper rivets. And I, I think this is a great picture because it really demonstrates how far we can take a boat apart, how much new wood we can put into it, and yet how original it still looks. You can see th all this patina on the inside of the planking is, is um, you know, it's, it's, it's nice and dark and rich, and there's, there's no stain there. That's just age. And you can see here there's a, there's a butt where two planks come together, and you can see some evidence of the old fasteners, but it's, it's clean, and it, it, it shows the history, um, and it's, it's consistent. And there's the deck frame just plopped back on. Um, one thing that we do across the boards is, is replace plank decks with plywood decks. And uh, it's, it's just one of those things that's, that's easy to do. It will never be seen again. And it, it adds so much strength and longevity to the boats that it's, and unless, it's a, unless it's a restoration for a museum that's never going to be used again, um, it's, it's just so easy to do this. And, and you know, having the, an adhesive joint between the shear plank and the underside of the deck coupled with a laminated keel just absolutely locks the shape of this boat together so she won't hog again. And there's a nice view of the new stem head and the top of the plywood deck's been epoxy coated. Here's some modern technology. We, uh, we use a vacuum pump to laminate the combings onto the um, onto the form here. And, uh, and these combings, I think, are a good example of, of how epoxy can really do as, as much harm to a project like this as it can help. Um, the original combings for the boat were, were actually in pretty good shape, but, but during a previous rebuild, they'd been glued into the boat with epoxy. And so there was no way to get them out without destroying them. And, and that, was, that was too bad. And here's the new, new combings being fit into place, the pattern on the deck for the ends. The new combings are, are set in. And then we did opt to put canvas back on the deck, and that's, that's one great thing about plywood for decks, is you can, you can cover it with traditional canvas, and it, it looks uh, exactly the same as a plank deck, uh, only you'll never see the seams coming through, and it'll, it'll stay adhered. And we use a, a latex lagging adhesive to, to glue it down, um, 
which is like the stuff they use to wrap steam boilers. But it's, it's nice because it's a latex. It shrinks the canvas at the same time. It glues it to the plywood. And then we use a Monel or stainless steel staples to, uh, to attach it. And here's the new, uh, new teak sole and new uh, cockpit framing for the seats. And again, looking at the inside of the planking, which will always be visible, it, it really, you know, I, I think looks old, which, uh, which I think if we'd replaced the planking, you would have lost a lot of that, that, um, that value. The, uh, the boat came to us without a sole or without seats. Um, it, it just had plywood for the, for the bottom to stand on, and uh, it, was, it was just floating in there. And uh, we made a new tiller for the boat as well. It's a nice piece of uh, locally grown black locust and a new, uh, new tiller head that uh, replaced a stainless steel one that had been added sometime earlier in her life. You can see the deck's been painted and there's a uh, varnished uh, rub rail around the perimeter of the boat that holds down the edge of the canvas. Helps to uh, define that transition. And the centerboard being installed. It looked, it looked like there was a Finish on the inside of the planking? Yeah, we varnished it um, in this case. And, and actually, you bring up a really good point. We, uh, most of these boats were never finished on the inside, or sometimes they just get a thin coat of white lead or, or, or some sort of shellac. And by, by really thoroughly finishing the inside of the boat, typically it's painted and not varnished. But, but that adds tremendously to the longevity by reducing the uh, seasonal uh, expansion and contraction of the floor timbers and the planks. Uh, the fasteners don't loosen up, and the, the you know any water that is able to pool from dry leaves and what have you won't won't rot its way through the boat. The centerboard going in. So the uh, the mast we uh, it, we had this lovely patina. It's a Sitka spruce mast from the early 30s, but it was coming unglued. The varnish was peeling off, and you could see the varnish had cracked all the way along the glue seam. So in in an effort to save it, we just started with some shingles at the top, trying to split it in half. And we, we got almost all the way down to the bottom. By, by the time we got to the, um, to, to the end of the uh, coved section, we had to start cutting to uh, finish it off. So there's a small <coughs> spline in the bottom to make up that wood. But the rest of it, we were able to just clean up and glue back together. And uh, there were a few localized repairs where there was old hardware that, that had done some damage. And this is just a, a nice shallow scoop with a new piece of uh, Sitka spruce glued in. But you can, you can see the glue seam's been renewed. And, and with 10 coats of varnish, it still looks like a 90-year-old uh, mast. The spreaders had to be replaced. These bases are original, but somebody had used a galvanized conduit for the uh, spreaders at some point. And so here she is out in the yard being rigged. Um, Got rid of all the colored fleck line and went back to some nice three-strand spun Dacron that's dyed to, to look like vanilla. New bronze body turnbuckles. And again, seeing that, that shear back is a real, real nice, nice thing. What, what was your total time frame for the I, job? I think three people did this in about four months. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say about 1,000 man hours, but I don't, I don't remember for sure. And here's a before and after of the, uh, the shape of the boat. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I think that the thing that, that excites me more, more than how different they look is how similar they look. And, and if, if, there's, if there's one thing I think that we were, we were successful at, it was, it was respecting that, um, that heritage and that, that those details, you know, the, the varnish transom and this, this sign was made out of particle board were, were something that a sign maker had done. But going back to the painted transom with the uh, bronze letters, I think is a much, it's just it's understated, it's simple, and it's the way it, it would have been. Because these were never intended to be flashy. They were, they were sort of utilitarian in their, in their use. And so these next few pictures after we launched the boat were, were shot by Allison, who's here in the back and uh, filming us now. But uh, Classic Boat Magazine in the UK did a feature article on this restoration, and uh, they hired Allison to, to shoot the launching and the first sail. So that was uh, great, and it was nice of uh, them to make the, the photos available. This is a, a great example of a, a totally modern piece of hardware that, that comes from J.M. Reinick and Son. 
and it's, uh, it's got modern Harkin roller bearings and springs, and uh, the block has modern Harkin bearings as well, so it performs as well as anything that, uh, that you could buy today, but once it has been outside for a little while, it gets the patina and it looks appropriate. And there's the, the new tiller head again. They ended up putting the outboard bracket on after, uh, after we delivered it, but it was uh, understandable. She's way up into a bottleneck harbor, and that's kind of the only way to get out. This is the owner in the pink shorts, and uh, Justin Ward, our, our service manager, that took the boat down. One thing that's a little unfortunate with this boat, to me, is the sails. Um, but I think it's in, important to recognize that, that these fleets that are still active, like the Dark Harbor 20s over in Islesboro and um, the Harrishoff 12 and a halfs that, that race all up and down the coast, they, they're, they're, they're out there to win races, and people are really competitive. So regardless of how good the boat looks, um, you know, the fact that the ends are higher than the middle doesn't make it go any faster. And, um, and so having modern sails that are also used by the rest of the fleet in this case was really crucial to the success of the project. But to me, it was really stressful. Every time they started luffing or flapping, you just wanted to jump overboard from the noise. <laughs> yeah. Something, you know, so originally the boat would have had cotton sails and, and the sound they make in a jive is just like a gull's wing. I mean, it's so quiet and graceful. <coughs> it's, uh, it, it'd be nice to see people going back in that direction. But at the end of the day, winning races is uh, what 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 come brings brings the uh, you know other boats in the fleet back for similar treatment. Do they have spinnakers? I don't. Yes, yes, they do because there's a there's a fitting for one on the front of the mast, but I've never seen them up. So I I, I know they do. They're probably modern spinnakers though. Uh, and, and not the old asymmetrical balloon types that, that the gaff rigs used. You know the sail area where the Marconi is? It was, uh, it was in that first slide, and, and I. Center, that yeah. sounds about right, yeah. It's yeah, any of these older designs are, are massively over canvassed by, by any modern standard. They have 310 square feet of sail, but they. Uh, I, I think these days, if people have to reef, they think there's something wrong with their boats. And, uh, and, and back then, these things were designed to be able to win races in Long Island Sound, where there's three or four knots of wind, if you're lucky, for months at a time. So they, they'd have everything up on the light days and be out there in 30 knots of breeze with double reefs and storm jibs. You can see a lot of the plank lines um, in these photos that are in the sun. And, uh, we uh, politely asked Allison to Photoshop some of them out for the uh, classic boat <laughs> photos, but uh, but it's 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 exactly what the boat should be doing. Um, a wooden boat depends on the swelling force compressing the planks against each other and against the cotton to to to, to make them strong, and um, being over cocked over the years and not being well painted and having a lot of excessive drying and shrinking and then re-swelling. Um, makes the plank successful, you know, it's collective edge set. They get smaller and smaller and people drive in more and more cotton and the boat just loosens up. And so by resetting these planks back against each other during the rebuild, we're able to start that process from scratch or, or stop it ideally if the boat's well stored in the off season. So uh, she came back to us after the first year and we refared the hull and it, it looks like a mirror now and it'll be, you know, we'll see a few slight seams next year and after three or four years they'll, they'll go away completely. Uh, it's just epiphanes, monourethane, so a single part oil-based enamel. We work a lot with epiphanes down in Thomaston, and they do a lot of us uh, custom colors for us, and really just their, their paints and, and varnishes are really excellent. Is she window stored in your yard up here? Yes, yeah. Yeah, there aren't many yards down in that far south that, that really know what to do with wooden boats. And it's, it's unfortunate there are, there are some yards that, that won't even accept them. They, they just flat out will, won't have anything to do with them. So. Uh, it's canvas. Yep, yep, traditional canvas. Um, 
We put down a layer of it's, it's sort of a consistency of wallpaper paste. So we, we brush it on and lay the canvas in it um, to get that initial bond and then come right over the top with some more of the same product that's thinned down to, to be more like a thick paint. And then we'll go back over that with an oil based paint once it's dry and shrunk. So what gave it its color with the oil based paint? That yes. Yep, yeah. yep, yeah, exactly. They have backstays? Yes, yep, there's, there's running backstays. <laughs> On some of the new replicas we've done, we've increased the mass section to eliminate them, and that makes them a little bit more uh, easy as day sailors. But on a boat like this with a centerboard, you need two or three people on a blustery day, so it, it's nice to give them all something to pull on. <laughs> <laughs> well, does he perform up to the owner's expectation? He, he won at least two races this summer, and I, I think he was quite pleased. He, uh, he, was, he was pretty excited. <coughs> hey, Alan? Yes? Could you explain again, uh, I hate to make you repeat yourself, but how the rudder was attached with that? It, one? It, uh, when you have sort of a, a barn door rudder, which is a lot longer than it is tall, there's, there's no need for the bolts to go all the way through it. So they'll, they'll usually be pocketed in maybe three or four inches aft of the uh, shaft. And so the, the bolts, the fore and aft bolts that connected the shaft to the, the blade of the rudder were uh, galvanized threaded rod. Oh, okay. and, and where they had threaded into the bronze shaft just uh, disintegrated. Right. Okay. Allison, I think this was one of the shots that they used in the magazine, wasn't it, that, uh, that you photoshopped out the plank seams? Yeah. Yeah, that was the vertical version of that, which hoping for a cover that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> so where's our home port now? Groton uh, Long Point, which if anybody's better at geography than I am, is what's, what's a near, nearby? It's the east side of the river by New London. By New London, okay. Right next door to Mystic. Gotcha, yep. And we, we had her at the Mystic Boat Show, now that you mention it. And that was close by. One thing that I, I really love about these early designs that we don't see enough of anymore is, is just how close to the water they put you. And when you look at, at modern boats like the J24s and, and J22s and whatever else they're racing these days, um, self-bailing cockpits are, are in vogue and they, uh, you know, they, they really give you the sensation of sitting on top of the boat instead of in the boat. And uh, to, to, to be down at the level of the water is, is a pretty cool sensation. Did the original boat have jam cleats for the running backstays? No, no, just cleats on the, on the side decks. Yeah, and I, I, think, I think we added jam cleats in this case. It's, a, it's an ongoing dialogue with, with most customers. You know, we're, we're trying to make the boat look as period as we can, and they're trying to make it go as fast as they can. And <laughs> we usually arrive at some, uh, some consensus. There's, uh, there's give and take. There's a good uh, example of a uh, concession that uh, was made in the final hours. We might hold in the classic boat article from December of 2014. She was nominated for their um, Boat of the Year awards for restorations under 10 meters, and uh, she didn't end up winning that award, but we, uh, we ended up getting their Editor's, Editor's Choice Award for Artisan Boat Works, which we are proud of. So that's it for Gull, but <coughs> I just really quickly, if, uh, if everybody's not falling asleep, wanted to touch on some boats that you probably drive by all the time that are sitting in door yards and backs of boat yards that, that, that have a um, history as rich with uh, Camden Rockport and the local islands as the um, Groton Long Point boats and the, uh, these uh, Fishers Island 24s do down there. Um, Camden, as, as many of you know, had the, uh, the high boats, the fin class from what probably the uh, early 40s, late 30s, early 40s, right through the 80s. And there's, there's still a handful of those around. But, but before that, back in uh, 1914, B.B. Crown and Shield designed the Camden class. 
and there were only three of them built, but there were these beautiful gaff rig knockabouts. Um, there's one that the, uh, the um, Cabot family owns over in North Haven. There's, there's one derelict over on Route 90 that, that is uh, in slightly worse condition than uh, Gull was when we found her. Um, but out in Islesboro, they've got the Dark Harbor 20s, the Harishoff 12 and a halfs are still racing actively. They used to have the 17s and the 12s, but in, uh, in 1932 when Sparkman and Stevens came out with the Dark Harbor 20s, the whole fleet of 12s and 17s was sold to Bucks Harbor, and, and I grew up racing on the 12s over there. And those, those don't race actively any longer, but there's still quite a few around. North Haven has the, the, the North Haven knockabouts, which is that, that oldest class in the country. Um, or the dinghies, rather. The North Haven knockabouts are the same as the Dark Harbor 17s. Um, there's still three of them racing out there. Harishoff 12 and a halfs as well. And uh, this is a Camden class sloop, a 1915 ca Camden class sloop. I, I shot that a week ago when we got that uh, lovely uh, little bit of snow, but that's, uh, that's a shot of, uh, of what, what she could look like. Who built those? Uh, they were built by Rice Brothers down in Booth Bay who built a lot of the main one designs. Either Hodgson's or Rice Brothers were probably the two prominent main boat builders of, of one designs. Are they 29 overall? Um, I think so. They're quite, quite short. I think they're only 17 on the water, um, but, but 20, that sounds about right. Is that the original jib design? No, that's a larger one that somebody added. The original ones were, were uh, probably self-tacking on a club. And there's a, there's a high boat that's on the side of the road in North Haven, or uh, Northport, I'm waiting for a restoration, and there's, there's two or three other high boats around that are in similarly languishing states. This is one of the Dark Harbor 20s from Islesboro, and uh, you can see the before and after. And this, this brings up a lot of, um, you know, that philosophical conversation about um, replacing with fiberglass. This, this family made a conscious decision to, to honor the fact this boat had been with them since it was new. And, uh, but, but was really intent on, on um, making her perform and, and um, bringing the maintenance costs in line with a fiberglass boat. So we, uh, we splined all the seams. You can see all the hull seams have been routed out and we, uh, we glued in cedar splines and then the boat's been epoxy coated and fared to a modern standard. And uh, I, I don't remember what that cost, but I think it was about 15 or 20% less than the cost of a new fiberglass boat. So they were really able to have the best of both worlds. And there's the uh, the Dark Harbor 17s. This was one of the most popular classes in uh, the 20, you know, from the teens through the 40s in Penobscot Bay and up to Northeast Harbor. They were the Dark Harbor 17s, the North Haven Knockabouts, the Northeast Harbor B boats. There were probably 150 of these things built for, uh, you know, this 50-mile uh, area. And there's there's a lot of these around that are restorable still. Harishoff 12 and a halfs. This is one that went aground on North Haven and. Got fixed up. So that's it. Thank you. So yeah, any other questions? Where do you get your wood? Oh, all over. Um, that's a great question. We uh, the the local woods are actually more difficult to come by than the exotic ones. We uh, we work with America's Wood out in Washington for teak and mahogany and. All of our millwork, uh, West Coast woods, all come from them. But uh, cedar and uh, and oak, usually we work with small mills, and it's it's hit or miss as to who's got good quality. And uh, cedars become particularly difficult because all the the loggers make so much money sending shingles to Nantucket that you just can't. No boat builder can <laughs> buy enough volume to for them to justify cutting the cutting the wood into anything longer than eight foot lengths. Hey, yes. Do you guys find it more interesting to restore? I don't know what your, how, how much time you spend restoring versus like new builds, but do you find it more interesting to restore a boat? I mean, That's a great question. I, I, I think that we, uh, we, we really love doing things that we haven't done before. And, and so it, uh, I'd say our workload is probably 50-50 with you know, maybe 45-45 well, you know, with 10% doing projects for larger yards like spars for Rockport Marine or Hodgson Brothers and things like that. But um, yeah, I, I think. You know, every every boat is a new challenge, and you learn something. So it's, uh, you know, the uh, th there's a lot we learn restoring old boats that we can apply to building new ones. Mm -hmm. 
it all was center board with wood, wasn't it? Yes. Yep, yep, that was wood, and, and it had some weight just to sink it, but probably not more than 50 pounds or so. Mm -hmm. what, what projects are you working on now? Um, we've got three, three projects right now. We're, we're building a, a little 22-foot Joel White day sailor um, that's going to become the W-22 class for Donald Tophius that's done the 76s and the 46s. So we're, we're building two of those this summer. Um, we've got a Nantucket Indian that we're restoring and then a uh, set of spars for a 65-foot David Petrick yawl that Hodgson Brothers is doing. So if anybody drives by the shop, we've had to build a 50-foot extension out the end to <laughs> accommodate this 85-foot mast. You know, these restorations are you know, super tough, but how close do you come to your original plan as far as budget-wise, time-wise, and, 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 or is it... As, as, as close as possible, yeah. you know, <laughs> <laughs> I guess is the honest answer. Um, you know, on, on, on depend, the, the more similar the project is to something we've done before, the more accurately we can estimate it. Um, the, uh, the, the, the key is really to, to avoid creep, and I, I think that with bigger boats, this, this has a greater tendency to happen, but you, you oftentimes run into the while we're here factor, and so you, you'll look at a boat that from the outside needs a certain amount of work, but consistency is everything. You really, you know, you, 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 you want to be as um, value conscious as possible on these projects, and there's a lot of things you can do that, that just don't make good financial sense. And there are a lot of things that, by not doing them, don't make good financial sense. So we really try to, to be consistent. And a lot of the time, you'll take a piece of wood that looked perfectly good when the boat came into the shop, but as soon as you've surrounded it with brand new wood, you have to ask yourself, geez, that wasn't a problem before, but now that we've got this area exposed, is it going to last 80 years like the rest of this wood or only another 40 years? And would it be irresponsible not to replace it while we have access? So trying to, trying to be honest with yourselves at that point and not um, you know, continually reevaluating throughout the process is probably the key there. Do your guys on the floor, are they able to make that kind of decision or do they bring them all to you? They, they all come to me. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, when, when, when we started this place 12 or 13 years ago, it was just me and the fellow in the blue shirt there, and, and now we're up to 14 people, and, and, and I, I wish I got my hands on my tools more often than I do, but I, I find most of, most of my work is just facilitating between customers and, and the guys on the floor and trying to help the customers make the right decisions and keep, uh, keep everything running along. Feeding the machine. <laughs> How do you uh, plot and cut the templates? Um, for the molds that are, are developed on the computer, um, we can do it one of two ways. Either they're plotted on mylar, and then we can roll that o out over plywood and, uh, and make the transfer. Or if we're doing a lot, we'll have it CNC cut, um, where they just lay the plywood sheets down in a computer where the router comes and cuts the shapes out for us. And, do you have a plotter? No, no. We, we work with Gartley and Dorsky or with Rockport Marine. That's one of the unfortunate things with the CNC technology is, and, and, the, and the, the CAD design software is it's, it's undeniably good at what it does, and it's a lot more efficient than the old-fashioned way of lofting boats on the floor, but it makes the builder completely dependent on the people who can run the software, and, and so the, uh, the, the trade is really moving wholeheartedly in that direction, and those of us that do traditional boats are really forced into, into coming around to, to, to embracing that stuff. And it's exciting, but I, I, I wish that I was, uh, wish I had the time to go back to the landing school and take their design class and learn how to do it myself. Alex, this, this argument about, you know, making a decision on what you keep in and what you keep out, um, you know, different times I've read debates about when is a restoration a new build? Yeah. Where do you sort of fall on that? That's a great question, and this is, this is where the morality comes into it. And, and people, especially with some of these really prestigious Harishoff boats, get really passionate about these things. And, and uh, you know, Maynard Bray, I think, wrote one of the best definitions I've heard is that if the boat looks like a boat the whole time, then it can be considered a restoration, even if you replace every single piece. And it's sort of the, 
the old adage of you know George Washington's axe that chopped down the cherry tree, and it's had two new heads and four new handles, but it's still still the same axe. So <laughs> it's it's a good question, and and there have been a couple of rebuilds, like the coronet that's being done down at Iris now, and uh, one of the New York 30s that that was sank and and rebuilt at MPG down in Connecticut, but. Rather than doing what we did with Gull and, and sort of building a basket around the boat and putting new frames inside the old planks and then taking the planks off, they started at the end and they, they just took a chainsaw and they'd cut down through a frame bay and take a section of the boat away and replace it with a new frame, set of frames and, and you know, cross ball and a floor timber and they just systematically cut the boat apart like a CAT scan, took the old parts away and brought the new parts in. So it sort of looked like a boat the whole time, but you know, the shape was changing drastically. You know, you'd see the new boat and the old boat would be a completely different shape and it's, it's definitely blurring the lines a little bit. And, and I think in, in Europe, there have been some, some high profile restorations lately that have been really, really intent on saving every scrap of original fabric. And, um, you know, there, were, there was a restoration done last year by a car guy who, you know, was, was in, in cars, everything's got to have the right model number and serial number and, you know, not just be similar to what was there before, but actually be the right part. And so he wanted every single mistake that was made in the, you know, if a piece of wood had to be replaced, if there was a mistake, if the bolt had been drilled off center and half the washer had to be ground away, he wanted it to be exactly the same way. And uh, all the iron nails they used to fasten the deck down to the oak beams, he wanted iron nails put back in there because he wanted the boat to deteriorate exactly the same way the original did. <laughs> and he did a deep pocket. He did, but and, and, and a lot of people say he was nuts, but I think that you know at, at the end of the day, we try to reiterate that this is a you know this is a service industry. We're not you know we're not just in it for the boats, but we're 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 in it for the customers and the owners and making it interesting for them and making it fun for them. And uh, everyone's a little different. To, to, lend a, to the vendor guy, in, in that world of his automotive side, he, he actually will be deducted. Yeah. You know, at like Pebble Beach. Yeah. He would be deducted for that. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously he's taken the same approach in his vessels. Right, right. And, 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 and it was, um, you know, it drove the builders nuts because you'd have a, you know, a cedar plank that was 100 years old. It would take you know, half a day to replace it, but instead they'd fit in, you know, 40 little tiny graving pieces that were just removing the, you know, the minimal amount of original material to uh, um, replace the deterioration, but not, not removing, you know, trying to keep it as original as possible. And when you get into boats with elaborate deck structures and hatches and interiors, there's a lot more opportunity for that. So it's, you know, every project's different and, and we really try hard to focus on efficiency as much as on you know, respecting the original fabric. So it's, it's a balance. That was my opinion, and not especially educated, is that the planking on this boat was rather wide. Um, it, they, they taper, and, and you know, you're, you're, you're right. Um, you know, when, when these boats were being built, they were, were trying to maximize the materials, and the wider the plank, the more backing out it needs to have to get around a curve. So sometimes you'll see really <coughs> wide planks in the bottom where the run is flat and then they'll get narrower as they go around the turn of the bilge to avoid having to go with extra thickness. And uh, there's no question that the narrower the planks, the more stable they are. And um, this look like the wider fit, though it's approximately the same size as a, as a E-Class Harrisoft 15. Yep. It looked like there were fewer planks per side than yep. Yeah, I think you're probably right. For some reason, I remember that the e-boats have 13 planks per side, and I don't remember how many this had. But uh, you can, you, you can, if, if if you can reduce the number, or if you can, if you can increase the number, it, it's more stable. And the ultimate example is, of course, the strip plank boats that are edge glued, or some of the Harrishoff boats. The planks were narrow enough that they could be edge set, so they'd all be tapered on a master pattern, and then bent to shape rather than having to be spiled. When did you do the item? Uh, we've done two of them, and it was probably three and four years ago, maybe four and five years ago. And that's a great example of a fleet that is, has really appreciated way beyond what they're actually worth because it's a very tightly knit lake up in the Adirondacks, uh, Upper St. Regis, and you know there's, a, there's just a great community of people that race those boats, but there's a waiting list. If one of them comes up for sale, there'll be 10 people vying for 
um, for its spot, and and there 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 are no new ones that have ever been built, so it's uh, they're they're very sought after. And we see that sometimes more with uh, with cars too. I know what's the big auto auction place that started doing boats? Some of the Chris Crafts and Hackers and um, Beacon. Beacon, is, Beacon, yeah. Um, in South Florida, you'll get some stuff occasionally. Yep. Yep. Um, but the the automotive guys tend to gravitate to the barrel back boats. Yes. Yep. Yep. For some, I don't know if it's the, the motor thing or yeah. whatever. Yep. Um, yep. But yeah, they it's 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 out there. Yeah, and it, it's it's exciting to see. You know, wooden boats obviously went through a hard time where where nobody was building them anymore, and then when people did start building them again, there weren't that many people left who knew how to do it, and so there were a lot of short-sighted fixes, and they, they got this bad reputation. And I, I feel like with, with Wooden Boat Magazine and places like Rockport Marine, the industry is really coming back stronger than ever, and, and, and seeing you know boats starting to, to bring this, these collector's values is, is a great thing. Well, thank you again. Thank you.